So thank you, Simon, for coming and hanging out with me. Um, thanks for coming on the podcast. This is the Creative Jobs Podcast. And uh, why don't you tell me and everybody listening sort of who you are and like what you do for work, and then we'll kind of dive into uh, stuff. Okay. okay. Well, you know, work's an interesting phrase at the moment for a lot of us in the creative field. So uh, what I what I've been done what I've been doing for a very passionate hobby that has occasionally paid rather well. has has allowed me uh, a lot of travel and a lot of hotels and whatnot um yeah so you know some years back i jumped into the realm of photogrammetry um which is essentially 3d scanning um real world locations using photographs and you know uavs you know drones and stuff like that Mm -hmm. Uh, my personal interest was very much in um, preserving moments in time, history, things that might not be around for much longer, uh, cultural sites. So, you know, I think places in Egypt and uh, Lebanon or war-torn areas like uh, Aleppo. Uh, but also think about just cool art galleries or beautiful, you know, uh, places where bands used to play and then they got, you know, converted into a high-rise apartment or turned into a bloody car park, you know, so... Places of what you'd consider as historical, um, but also memorable, and so I got quite. I got into an, an oddest way possible. Uh, it, it found me. I did not find it. I was actually proud of it. Proud of doing any of this. Just a drummer and a singer in a band. Right. Just you know what I mean. I've, I've been just a lot of things over the years. Um, I seem to get bored every five years and move to something next. This is probably the longest time I've actually stuck at one specific thing. Um. So yeah, it's the it's the art of taking multiple photographs and archiving um, these locations, and then using computers to triangulate those uh, angles and coordinates into a three D mesh, and then getting that mesh into something that you can then run in real time on either desktop, VR, mobile VR, or web browser, so other people can then enjoy the experience for themselves. Um, it sounds simple, but there are uh, humend- there've been over the years tremendous. Uh, hurdles to solving how to get from A to B. And me personally, I wasn't classically trained in any of this. And so I tackled this in a very unique way compared to traditional industry. And as a result, uh, somehow built our own pipeline, uh, completely independent of how things were traditionally done. Um, And as a result, it's given us a multitude of advantages of thinking outside the box. Right on. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, photogrammetry was something I fell into a little while ago as well. I wonder how many people have that uh, similar sort of story. You're like, oh, I wasn't classically trained in this. Like, I bet so many people in this space probably weren't, right? Like, it, yeah. it's kind yeah. of, it, it attracts sort of these sort of like, uh, it's like a really bad expression, but like jack of all trades kind of people. Like, it's. Yeah, the misfits. Also, like, sound engineers. <laughs> yeah. You have to know you have to know a multitude of programs. Like when mm, people start mm. describing, like, "Hey, what program do you use to do your job?" and you just the list just starts going, and yeah. you're like, "What?" Yeah, yeah no, it um, is quite. Crazy. Oh, you go. Sorry. So, I wanted to ask you: when you're making photogrammetry, effectively, you're creating 3D meshes or models uh, of what you're capturing, uh, yeah. and then also, I guess. On the other side of that, which is what I personally got really into, was capturing spaces. So, like the inverse yeah. of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Environments is more our passion. Absolutely, we don't really focus. I mean, I, I personally, you know, every photogrammetrist started on their vans, you know, their mm. shoes or whatnot. I mean, we have it's a running joke in the industry that you know we we call it the three D photogrammetry shoe club. <laughs> <You know? laughs> every, every, like shoes are like what you start with, or you know, and pine cones, ironically, or these kind of odd shapes that have a lot of occlusion issues and so they kind of teach you how to do things but for me personally it was always environments uh the first thing i did was probably in 2014 that kind of uh i I joke say it broke it broke reddit basically it was my most viewed video which is not actually that viewed but it got a lot of attention because people in 2014 thought i was just running around with a fucking handy cam um they didn't believe i'd actually you know that this alleyway was actually running an unreal engine at, at the time um, right so yeah environments have always been my personal passion it's you know you, you get out in the field you know it's nice to get out of the house and uh it's it's extremely more challenging than assets because of the just the pure scope and scale of 
how much texture data and how much uh, point cloud you actually acquire. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when I was learning to do it, um, it was figuring out your capture patterns became like immediate, like, oh, this is really important, you know. Yeah. And I think over the years we've had such strides in these programs that are sort of automated, if you will, like putting it all together. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I remember first time I opened like Reality Capture and I was like, whoa. Yeah. Whoa. Fucking amazing. <laughs> whoa. Um, early beta, early beta. It was James Busby who got me like early betas of Reality Capture, I, I believe. Um, obviously, Nova Team extremely well now. Mm -hmm. But to go from that to Agisoft with the GPU acceleration was just mind boggling. Right. Like so much faster. Um, but yeah, I mean, like the point is, you know, it's, it's, it's relatively easy to get the point cloud processed from, you know, take from photons to point cloud. But the, 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 the big issue has always been how to get from point cloud to, you know, efficiently running an engine with PBR materials or physically based rendered yeah. materials. This of that jazz. And so, um, I, I find a lot of people were running around taking photos and doing LIDAR of amazing historical places, but it's not, it's not, it's not in my opinion and even more so strange after the pandemic is I could not understand why more of these places were not actually in headsets or accessible to the public during, uh, the lockdown periods. Right. And so that's where we truly pivoted over the last two and a half years being in our own personal lockdown in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, we really just strive to how do we make this, you know, a bit more like a weekly news recap rather than like some six to 12 month project that, you know, might be shown at a theater sometime. You know, we, we want to make this more um, accessible to mass user media consumption rather than some kind of once a year kind of niche. If that makes so sense. Yeah, so so help me understand two things. Number one, what would you say your if someone said, "What do you do? What's your job title?" Give me that. But also, like anybody can capture photogrammetry. What yeah. are you doing with it? What are they hiring you to do with it? What are they doing with it after you've captured and processed it? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, on the field stuff's relatively straightforward. It's pretty much like any film or shoot. You know, you get few guys, a few lackeys, you know, some data wrangler to handle the data, someone to bring you coffee. It's always nice if you have that, but you don't really need that. You know, just two, two peeps can just jump out and do this. You know, you have one guy for UAV and one guy, with, you know, the ground level camera, preferably. Um, always nice to have a bit extra, especially if you're, you know, like, especially if you're out in the Middle East or somewhere like that, yeah. you know, you, you, you need a fixer. You, you need someone to help translate. Um, yeah, initial data acquisition is relatively easy. Um, it's it's getting that dense point cloud and actually making it run an engine in real time efficiently. That is has been the bottleneck for everyone. And so my job title, um, um, I mean, technically it's called CBO, Chief Visionary Officer. Um, but, I like that but one. I, I, I'm basically in the business. Like I, I love to be on the ground. I love to be in the field. I've got my Nikon D850 right behind me. So I really do love to actually be out and about, but basically I've been in the business of how do you build a pipeline as automated as possible so we don't spend six, eight weeks per project, but rather, you know, you know, I mean, the most recent thing is we're, we're you know, we're, we're, we're number crunching within days on first generation Threadrippers. If we upgraded our Threadrippers, we could be creating whole entire scenes from photon to game ready asset within hours. Right. Yeah. And then, so, like, if somebody got into photogram, like, like myself, when I first got into photogrammetry, I was like, wow, this is amazing. How do I make money at it? Or, like, what's the job that I apply for? Like, what are they doing with it after you've captured, when they hire you uh, to capture something? Well, I mean, depending on the client, which would, just to be clear here, we, I can't hesitate this enough, the last two and a half years I've been stuck on an island. Uh, we've had no actual work work as to say um um on 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 actual locations just because of the, the lack of travel okay. um for us in particular like we were only basically allowed out in march i was meant to go to ukraine slash russia in march it was my first gig and you can imagine where this is going <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. Um, so I was like, you know, yay, we get get off the fucking island. And yeah. and I was all amped and I was all healthy and happy and ready and, you know, you know, hello world. And and then all of a sudden everyone's running to New Zealand because we're worried that they're going to drop bombs on everyone. And so us Kiwis were, you know, were double shell-shocked, I guess. Mm. Um, and so finally got out in June to kind of get back out into the field and see what we can recover. But, you know, we're talking about a two and a half, three year pause here, especially with us. I mean, as a creative who whose whole life was based on travel and going to these locations, it has been extremely difficult. Sure. Um, and so luckily we were able to secure a little bit of funding here and there to, you know, build the pipeline out. Um, but getting back to it, like what the, what the parties do with the assets in the past when we've actually produced these things, um, uh, basically, museology would be one of the big things. So, you know, museums, mm-hmm. you know, real-time virtualizations on big LED projector screens, uh, VR headset content for people who just want to go and see these locations. Um, you know, works like Nefertari and Tutum Carmen um, and other works like that where, you know, just for the sake of enjoying a site that you can't see. Um, we released a lot of the stuff 2018, 2019, and the VR space hadn't really taken off. So now that the VR space is actually taking off quite well. And there is actually a decent uh, audience. We're very excited to get more of these out there. Right. Um, yeah, running into a little bit of a sticking point, but you know, like we can mention, we can talk about that later in the conversation. Um, but I, I, my primary focus is, is, is for education. And, you know, I want my daughter to have the best social studies class you can ever fucking have. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, that, yeah. That, that, my, 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 my personal interest in this is really simple. You can't access a lot of the sites that, we had access back in 2018 anymore. Um, that just right. been locked down due to degradation or, uh, you know, political conflict or whatever. So it's, you're um, sort of in the business of preservation in a digital way, right? Like, yeah, yeah. I, I remember the first time I, they're all over my studio here, but I have all, like every VR heads that ever made. But the first time yeah. the go came out, I think that the, Rift was already out when the Go came out. I met, mm-hmm. but I bought it because I was like, whatever, let me buy this. It was like, you know, there's no strings attached. Uh, the first time I, I opened up this program, I forget what it was called, but they ha- they had a few locations you could visit. It was like Mount Rushmore and like a few other places you could visit. And yeah, I, sh- yeah, I showed yeah. it to my wife. And it was the first time she understood this thing that I was like doing stuff in. You know, I was like, look, this is like where this is going. This is amazing. And she was like, this is cool. It's like I'm there. Plus, with the Mount Rushmore one, it was like you're standing on the face of the president. Like, you couldn't actually be that close, I don't think, in real life. You're, you're no, no. quite far away looking, you know, through binocular system or, or just staring at it. But um, so it really gives you a lot of proximity to things, like you were saying, that you probably, most people wouldn't have. So that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. I had Trinity Church hire me and some people to capture the inside of it um, before they were going to do a big renovation. So we were like capturing it for preservation mm-hmm. of like sort of remembering these segments of the church that they were redoing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what what do you think led you to to get into this kind of work? How did how did you get there? That's you know it's such a fascinating line of work. Oh shit! <laughs> Sorry, I'm not yawning because of that. I'm yawning because oh, it's it's a it's a, the yawn was a reflection of my um it's it's a it it, it found me. Um, hmm. I would like to say um oh, it's a hard one, man. Um, even even now. So about eight nine years ago, um. Uh, as I said, I was just the, the epitome of living the urban lifestyle, drummer, singer in a band, you know, beautiful daughter, beautiful partner, uh, beautiful house I'd renovated top to bottom, YouTube did the whole damn thing. Um, it was a diamond in a rough. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, we just, yeah, I mean, long story short, we, we woke up the flames one morning uh, and the house was gutted. Um, after the house, uh, I was actually going through a four or five year custody battle at the time. And my battle, uh, my court hearing was ironically a few days later and they just 
I'd waited years for this hearing and they just threw it out. It was meant to be a five day hearing. They threw it out half the half the day. They said, oh, the, the guy doesn't have a house, you know, blah, just give it to the mum. Uh, and then obviously wow. me and my partner broke up and then sometime later she took her own life. So I went through a series of events that basically gave me post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and I didn't know how to deal with it for quite some time, like about a year and a half. I was just completely broken. Mm. Um, but I remember this, I, I remember this TEDx talk, uh, TED talk I'd watched about the software called Photosynth back in 2008 that Microsoft had acquired. Um, and I remember that at the time in 2008, I was really like, this is really cool. I'm going to take a whole bunch of photos of my house to see if I can do it. But at the time I, I had no money. I didn't really have a decent camera or anything, just a shitty smartphone at the time. Um, but I was like, Hey, could I, you know, use what I have got to recreate my house? And so I went through this absolute mad hatter stage for a year and a half, two years, just sitting in my room from 2013 to 2015, just kind of trying to see what I could do do and you know rediscovered photogrammetry which i'd already known through photosynth but didn't realize it was photogrammetry at the time and mm. went to see if i could actually you know rebuild um my whole idea was to basically rebuild the house while taking mdma to basically <laughs> reinforce negative memories of positive memories um rewire my brain essentially right. um and, and then it just ended up spiraling out of control i just ended up doing some stuff uh, it was 2015, uh, 2014, I did the alleyway video. Everyone was like, whoa, this is insane. 2015, I think it was 20, no, it was 2016. Uh, Dana Cawley, the head of marketing for Epic, just messaged me one day and she's like, hey, um, do you want 20,000 US dollars? I'm like, what for? She says, oh, just take it. I'm like, uh, okay. I've never been on a frigging plane in my life. Huh. 35 years old, never traveled, never been off the island. Uh, and 20,000 US was two times my social welfare pay, you know, so I'd get, you know, maybe 10,000 US a year in New Zealand for social welfare, you know, solo dad. Oh yeah, I did. I did regain custody of my daughter, by the way, uh, primary that's school good. custody. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's another story in itself. But, um, <laughs> um, the mum made me a great now, by the way, she's awesome. Uh, she's amazing. Just, it, you know, it takes time for people, who, you know, she was I was young, she was younger, you know, it just takes time for right. things. It's, we're, we're, we're super good now. Um, but yeah, just never been on a plane, jumped to LA in 2016, 2017, 120 flights later around the world, it just kind of spiraled out of control, um, came back to New Zealand to do my TEDx, TEDx talk and then got stuck in New Zealand for another two and a half years. So, so what was she, what were they hiring you to do at first? Just straightforward okay. photogrammetry? And they were uh, no, offering no, you the no, money. No, no, they, 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 just, they just said, we really love your work and we really love how, how much you're pushing Unreal. And this is phenomenal. Like, you you know, people joked that I was doing Unreal Engine 5, you know, back in Unreal Engine 4.2, you know. Yeah. Like, if you look at the earlier works of 2016, like Mana VR and all that stuff, I mean, it still shines pretty damn high to today's standards, if not even still at yeah. the standard. It's It's... it's um and so yeah i just ended up i mean i just we ended up going on one massive world tour of synchronicity like there'd be times i was like i would have six dollars in in san francisco but somehow something would just come up and it'd give me another few months to survive very much like what i'm doing right now man i keep my flight keeps on getting delayed back to New Zealand. I'm meant to right. be flying back tomorrow, but I was meant to fly back Monday. I was meant to fly back two weeks ago. I was meant to fly back four weeks ago. It just keeps on um, somehow, um, you know, uh, kind of living on the edge, which I'm kind of getting over now because I'm getting old, <laughs> you know, to be honest. I'm looking for the – I really want to get that beach house property in New Zealand soon. <laughs> Right. But um, yeah, it's 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 you know I'm not gonna be young forever, dude. And you know, so just, yeah, you're. So. But your background before you got into that, you said you're like a sound engineer. Like, hmm. what did you have any formal training? Did you go to college? Like, what's what was your sort of work experience before um, you were in photogrammetry? Uh, I did a lot of things. So I, I I'm a I don't even know what to call it. Like, I make stuff, <laughs> um, and I've always been like that. So you know, I've I've got I've done 
uh, I've done fine arts. Uh, I've done photography years ago, like traditional photography, like mm-hmm. good old developing film and all that kind of jazz. Um, I've done home automation, uh, uh, HTPC, home, home theater PCs and home automation systems uh, using natural language way back in 2008. That's how I made a living. I'd build these insane systems with 20 different pieces of software all hacked together using like PHP and auto hotkey and, and all this kind of stuff. And I right. you know, build things. So I just, I, I get ideas in my head and I just then implement the bare minimum of what I require to need to know to make that idea come into fruition. And right. so I guess my best skill would be, I'm really good at finding the exact question I need for an exact process to take place. Um, so, uh, same with audio engineering, just, you know, signal processing, all that kind of stuff, uh, Cubase tracker software. I guess I had some 3d experience back in 1989. I was doing like imagine and POV on my Amiga 500. So old classic computer, beautiful yeah. machine. Um, and so I, I was, I was like, uh, I was a weird kid, dude. I was like nine years old running a bulletin board system with my brother while doing like deluxe paint and imagine and other packages and 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 I, I my first company was zenith graphics when i was 11 and i remember painting the box for my product you know with paint <laughs> to sell to the masses you know um designing as so i did have some 3d experience but then you know obviously I, I went into teenagehood and discovered music and well you know when you discover music you discover girls and so yeah. I had 20 years of just being a bit of a, a, a drogo muso kind of you know, <laughs> sorry, punk kind of guy living crazy punk lives in the early two thousands. And like, that right. was messy. Stuff, dude. Like I've had multiple chapters, but, um, I, I'm really good at just working out how, how to make things. Uh, it's, it's mm. been a gift, but it's also been a really, I've never been able to be hired. Like I can't be hired because someone will hire me and I'll just tell them that they're wrong. <laughs> and that, you know, if something, is just, if something stupid, I just tell them and then I get fired straight away. Um, and the other one thing that's actually been a blessing and a curse is I'm, I don't follow particularly well with hierarchy or authority. Mm. And so it's given me a blessing in the sense that I seem to be able to kind of walk into any situation and not be phased by it. But at the same time, it really pisses some people off. And right. so, you know, there's this 50-50 thing where you either really hate me or really like me, basically. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I somehow sure. understand that. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's a weird thing, man. Um, yeah. So, yeah, there was not really any classical training, which in my defense, I think was a blessing because I didn't realize I was budging things or you know when i wanted four billion points of detail you know running in 2014 uh no one else was using things like udems at the time like udems multiple 8k textures all that kind of jazz i I jumped straight into multiple 8k textures i never ever did a single texture for any one of my scenes you know what i mean and well it's interesting because i've done that too but but because the technology is just advanced so much by the time i dove into this kind of a thing yeah um yeah that's fascinating it sounds like you have a a a large portion of an engineering sort of brain you know like just seeing a problem and being like all right i think i can figure out how to solve this um it's it's very fascinating if i feel like you probably could have done well if you were in the right place at the right time when ILM was forming, I feel like. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, I, I knew the guys at the Gibson group before Weta even became a thing, but the thing is I was nine years old and so they couldn't really right. hire me at the time. Yeah. But you, have you seen that new, sh- that show on, on, I think it's on Disney about the making of ILM, like how ILM started. No, no, I haven't. I, I oh, you, have, you have to it. watch it. I think you'll just, you'll probably kick yourself afterwards and be like, I could have, worked for these people mm-hmm. i think it was a little bit older than when you would have been but yeah the, it's fantastic the show is called uh magic and light yeah right it's so great but it showcases how a lot of these guys were just just like you man they were just people who had these sort of offshoot skill sets in very hyper specific ways that mm-hmm. all sort of coalesced 
in the sort of like visual effects movie making sphere. And then when George Lucas said, all right, I've got like 2 million bucks to create this company that's just going to make stuff for me to make movie magic. These sort of misfit guys were the perfect people for it and just revolutionized the industry. And to this day, I mean, they still exist. I mean, I won't lie, man. Look, being stuck in the middle of New Zealand has not done me any favors as a, as a, as a, bit of a child prophet or whatever the fuck you want to call it i don't like using that term but you know uh, <laughs> my, my 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 to be fiance in, in shanghai refers to it as being like an indigo child or something like that um i i don't know what it is all i know is that like i will dream this stuff like and my mind will just cycle on this mad uh phase of visual kind of putting things together over language and so right. I have this joke about how English is my second language, abstract thought is my first. Um, and I, I really mean that. Like I I kind of just I kind of just close my eyes and visualize stuff. And uh, the visualizations really do retain all these different modules of how things would plug in together. And the biggest issue is trying to then communicate that to a, a, a developer who's in the weeds, if you know what I mean, like forest <laughs> for the tree types. And yeah. they just think I'm fucking nuts. And I'm like, no, just just hear me out. Just do what I say. It will work. And, you know, the, the biggest problem I've had is, 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 is pushback. Not kind of... I, 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 I'm sympathetic to it. And I understand that most folk don't operate like that. But it, it, it is difficult. Um, that plus the isolation. And so I found it to be a lot easier, to be honest, man. Just, you know, I mean, like... I mean, with my music, for example, you know, I've got three albums, right? Mm-hmm. Um, they were all composed on computers back in the day when computers weren't really able to do music that sounded like real bands. And so I would spend all this time trying to work out how to hack the tracker software to make it sound as close to as real as possible. Right. But the other thing is I'd compartmentalize every component of it where I would refer to the different band members in the band as different people. And that's how it worked for me. I mean, I know that sounds nuts. It sounds like schizophrenia. It's not. It's just it's how I was able to get the different the drummer to play in a specific way to the guitarist to have their own unique quirks yeah. and stuff. And for me, it's really easy to compartmentalize like that. It's it, it's it's just you know I just think of the things as different components internally, and. Hmm. Yeah, it's, 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 and, and so, you know, going from that to this was a relatively easy task because it's all signal processing, garbage in, garbage out. How do I get right. this thing to make it into this thing? So the, the music I was doing, where we're fooling people and they're thinking it was a real band. Everyone thought the system era was a real band. Like I had multiple radio play and I'd go into these radio stations and they'd interview me and they'd be like, oh, so when are you guys touring next? And I'm like, no, you don't understand. <laughs> it's, I do this in my bedroom. <laughs> and so I finally got so sick and tired of it that, I, you know, because I just had my daughter at the time and I was like, look, if I'm going to actually get a band, I might as well learn how to be in a band. So I decided to learn how to play drums and sing at the same time, which is in itself a very difficult Phil Collins approach. Sure. Um, but, you know, so we got all the old tracks. Me and the guy, I got a bunch of guys together. We got all the old tracks. I'd be wearing the headphones. I'd, I'd strip down the tracks to bare minimum. So you'd have computer drummer, singer, bassist, guitarist. And, wow. and so, yeah, we started hammering that up. But like, I'd never learned drums either. So I just went, fuck it, I'm going to learn drums. <laughs> <You know>? so, <laughs> what year was this? Uh, that would have been uh, 2010 to 2012. But after 2012, I, I, after, you know, I mean, I, one, I lost the house. I lost the drum kit and everything mm-hmm. to the fire. But just prior to that happening, I was like, it was, you know, my daughter was, you know, yeah, she was, she was, she, she was growing up and I, I you know, my, my, I wouldn't say my lifestyle. I was a very good father, very, very functional, but yeah, it's just, it's just, you know, at that point I was like 25, 26. I'm like, okay, I got to make the house look nice and proper now and fancy and, you know, right. white walls and plasma on the wall. You know what I mean? I just, I, yeah. I needed the upmarket from my punk days. And mm. so I decided to throw on the towel and, that was 2008, and so we started selling the automation home theater PC systems, natural language. I mean, she actually thought it was a real person. Like, we called it Brian, and I was using Ivona text-to-speech for the voice, this beautiful British accent. You hear it all the time on the internet now. But, you know, I'd walk in, I'd be like, hey, Brian, 
can you download me some new Big Bang Theory? And, and you know, just run a whole bunch of scripts in the background, and the voice would be like, yeah, sure, Simon, one moment, blah, 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 you know. And, and like, Anika was so, Anika, that's my daughter, Moo, was so convinced because we'd had the system in our house for so many years. She thought Brian was a real human. <laughs> this <laughs> is such like, an insane story. I love it. This is <laughs> yeah. it's so, like, like science fiction like kid movies have tried mm -hmm. to do that. You were living, this is a real thing for you, but like, I think there was like a Disney movie that made a yeah. play on this sort of idea a while back, but that's I pretty had cool. Jarvis, I had Jarvis in 2008 and I still see systems now. I wasn't, I was using hierarchical language conversion methods, not even like Google API. It was yeah. just a hierarchical system where you could talk and I designed it so it could basically handle a bunch of off words and just pick up the primary words. But I guess I you know, say, hey, Brian, I've got a date tonight. You know, can you can you set the mood? And, you know, all the Philips Hue lamps would go to colors and the fireplace would open up on the TV. And, you know, I had cameras set up in the house. So when I come in, I knew who was coming in, who was coming out. Uh, you know, it, you know, play, you know, can you play me some soft jazz? All that kind of stuff. It was wow. everything in one. But we'd scripted it with the Pirate Bay and everything else. So I could just download torrents using my voice. <laughs> All the IMDB data was being scrapped automatically. I mean, I can't take credit for any of this because it was all third-party software packages that I just hacked right. and just kind of brought them together with a bit of modification. But it was, sure. it was the fact that I was able to know what all the different individual components were required to hack and put together and string together to actually make the, the, the bigger things. So I'm not a coder. That's the thing. I'm, I, I'm, mm. a, I'm someone who can read a bit of code and hack a bit of code. But if you ask me to write you know, write Python, I, I would be screwed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is so interesting to me about this work. But all right, so it seems like you don't really have any formal training in anything, but you have a sort of a magnificent mind, to, you know, to solve puzzles and, and sort of figure out how things work and go together to, to make something bigger than itself. Do you have any sort of creative influences that that maybe don't directly, if I don't know, anything that you look to, that like, mm, if one day I could be like this or do something like that? or well, I've been a hero of Elon Musk since 2008. Mm. Um, I've been following that guy. It was like I finally met someone who kind of, you know, it was like, hey, dad, dad, <laughs> you found my dad. Like, that's how I fucking felt, man. Like, he was a role model for me. Right. Um, but it was how he talked about things. I, I just got it. Like, you know, just, you know, and, and um, it's actually a really, it's a painful story because um, my family bought a beach house in 2008 in the, in the shitty location that none of us could access. You got to realize like being albino, uh, family of three, by the way, um, which is extremely rare in itself. Um, they bought a beach house, which we couldn't drive to or access to or had no public transport to. And I was like, hey, mum, dad, look, this is a stupid idea. By the way, it's now in a flood zone and it's a write-off. So $600,000 beach house that none of the kids could access. I was like, hey, guys, can I just take my 200K of that, like my inheritance right. in advance? And I was going to throw it all into Tesla stock in 2010. That's right. Yeah. $12 a share. Yeah. So every Christmas is fucking awkward, man. So, <laughs> so you weren't able to do this? No, I wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. And Golly. I, mean, I can't even stress how much that would have been now. I think it would have been about 34 million. Uh, it certainly would have funded any of these endeavors I've been trying to do. Everything we've done has been on a shoestring budget or literally on the doll. So everything mm. that we've I've had together, and that's not too bad in New Zealand because we have a good welfare system. We call it number eight wire. I think you guys would call it like MacGyver. We're good at MacGyvering things. But right. It's definitely been a restraint. I mean, like, I, I couldn't even imagine what would happen if someone gave Reality Virtual, like, $10 million just to fucking play with, you know? Right. Yeah, I remember, few, uh, you, I remember seeing some stuff you've posted over the last few years of, was it you guys that did, um, I think it was probably even before you formed your company, potentially, you were, you were doing photogrammetry, I want to say, somewhere in the Middle East or something, but you're using yeah. you built this rig it's like multiple cameras and you're yep, just holding yep, yep. this uh, capture, yep yep did that as well yeah <laughs> just hacked yeah. a bunch of connects together we're able to stream on a 4g network and delight and relight on your mobile device uh way back 2016 2017 
this was well, once again I just hacked it together with very minimal experience. What I actually used is I used my experience in Premiere and After Effects to work out I could do really intense noise reduction and signal processing of the RGBD feeds okay. and then compress the RGBD feeds into an MP4 encoder so you could actually essentially stream volumetric um, on a 4G network. And people were like, oh, I don't get it. <laughs> yeah, right? Everyone's just like, I don't get it. What's the point of this? I'm like, are you kidding me? This is this is like, yeah. So it's been difficult because of the lack of location, but also because in New Zealand, we have this company called Weta Digital. Right. And they Little sucked known up. company. Yeah, they sucked up all the oxygen in the room, dude. So Interesting. They, yeah, literally, I couldn't get a fucking shake, a fair shake because... You know, all the money just goes, all the money went to Weta. Have you, have you ever thought, I don't know, to the extent of what Weta is doing, have you, ever, have you ever thought over the years to try to work for them? It's, once again, it's a funny story. It's, I've, I know all the major players over the years and I've met and I've had, you know, really nice whiskeys with them, like from IOM, Digital Domain, The Mill, uh, Sony, Warner Brothers. Uh, but where we call it tall poppy syndrome in New Zealand or something like that. It's basically like you're very harsh on your own in New Zealand. So if you see anything that even comes close to kind of creeping in on your small pot of gold, um, you basically will just pretend they don't exist. And so hmm. I, I had conversations with every major studios around the world. I'd be flying, I'd be flying to South by Southwest to do talks and all that stuff. But never have I basically been asked to speak in New Zealand about anything I do. They will just, they'll, they'll fly, fly in an American before they'll ever fly me in, you know, 20 miles away. So it's just, Why, it's a, it's, do you, it's a cultural you, aspect that we have, yeah. Do you think, um, try, why do you think that is? Um, I think it's just the small island syndrome, man. It's, Interesting. You know, there's only so much resource and, you know, certain companies would get the backing by the government and others. Uh, what we refer to as the old guild in New Zealand, uh, mm -hmm. very protective of, uh, of their assets. The SIRs of New Zealand uh, don't make it easier, easy for us late stage millennials to jump in. Uh, and uh, I don't want to, I love my country, dude. I really do. I friggin' love it. But, you know, I'm not saying, I'm not joking when I say I, I'm, a, I'm, 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 I'm unhirable in New Zealand because of this exact reason. Um, things have changed a little bit now, obviously, with Unity buying Weta. And, you know, I'm pretty... Um, I'm I, did, I didn't know that Unity bought them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brought them um, uh, back in October last year. It was the weirdest conversation. Um, I'm having this chat with Joe Marks, who's the CTO of Weta, because he, he basically knows my company's about to go under because of the pandemic and stuff. He knows that I'm ripe for an acquisition. And he's just like... Uh, really love your work and like this was really cool for me because like i've been wanting weather some kind of weather validation for like five six seven years because i mean they're heroes to me man they're super heroes to me and yeah it really, it's, it's like elon musk and um nasa nasa like giving elon musk shit for you know right trying to jump in and elon's like fucking tearful about it because uh, you know nasa's his heroes it was, it was very similar for me i fucking love weather i mean i was nine years old hanging out with the gibson group which was pre-weather trying to like you know, do this stuff. And so uh, it's, it was really nice for Joe to say that. Um, but then the thing he said afterwards explained a lot because what happened a few weeks later was the acquisition of Unity. Joe's like, really love your work, man. You're a real cool cat, but you're a bit of a kid in the custody battle. And I, I didn't know what he meant at the time. And then obviously a week or two later, um, yeah. <laughs> Right. So it's been, it's just been a weird position where, you know, all, all, all the greats of the industry are more than happy to say that, you know, we're really good, but it's just this, this kind of like, I've almost been put into an OG category or something like that. Like we were just a tour ahead of our time or we, 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 we made a few people scared about acquisitions that they've made with other companies for way, way, way more than what they, than what we could have done things for. Sure. I mean, that's, that's, that's the big problem we're having right now is that people don't want to touch it because a lot of people have made a lot of bad investments. And if they then come along and make this other investment that was, did it at one one hundredth of the cost, it's going to look bad on their 
portfolio. And so we're finding yeah. a lot, we're, we're having to pivot away from the major game players and the major parties and, and go philanthropic now because philanthropic is the only thing that will basically touch our work because they don't have any baggage with us. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I th- uh, with a creative job like that, I, I have to imagine there are days that it doesn't feel that creative as well. Uh, yeah, the pitch decks and all that bullshit. The, 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 you know, the, the, the validation process, like, oh man, 2021 was tough. Like, you know, all these like cheesy ass VCs, like, you know, wanting their 10 page pitch deck. And I'm like, man, I don't need a 10 page pitch deck. Content is king. Just look at the damn work, you know? And fair. That's, that's the frustrating thing because, you know, you have, it takes me weeks to compartmentalize my, 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 my stage from being a pitch deck business guy to a creative. Yeah. It, it, it literally takes time physically to switch right. over. Yeah. Because they're two very different sides of the brain, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's it's not yeah. exactly the same, but I it's, it sort of resonates a bit with like, you know, my day job. I'm a colorist um, at a post production company. Well, actually, we're more than that now. We had a bit of a merger, so we're sort of a content creation company. But, um, so, like, s- writing out stuff for clients, or or even like just getting a resume together. You're like, my demo reel is way more important than anything you read in some sort of like email. Like if I was applying for a job or something, you know, yeah, yeah. like just here's a website, have a look, you know? <laughs> so I totally yeah. get that. Um, <laughs> you know, here's me walking down the red carpet in Cairo, you know, at the film festival. Here's my Lumia award. What do you guys want? <laughs> like, yeah, that's such a, it's such an here's, artist here's, mindset though. Here's all the companies. I mean, like, even on a business side, here's all the companies that have thrown money into us and asked for next to nothing in return. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, we've had NVIDIA, AWS, Epic. Um, you know, I mean, it's not been a lot of money. I mean, I, I joke that the money we received in the mega grants, you know, I could have basically been an accountant in New Zealand and earned the same kind of money. Um, we did yeah. a hell of a lot more, though. But... The joke, um, the joke in post production in New York City, at least, is like some. It's sort of like a running sort of bit, which is like, oh, you've worked for Nike and Adidas, cool. So is everybody else, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, so like yeah. when you're whatever in your brain, you're like, man, I've done a lot of cool stuff. I've done these things. These companies have come to me. They've done all these things with me, like. In New York, maybe we're just super jaded, like jerk offs. But it's just like, okay, everyone else has done the same thing too. What's what makes you special? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I still like. I like New York. Fucking love Greenpoint, man. Beautiful place. Yeah, um, I'm not. I'm not too I far from it right now. Yeah, yeah. So, are there ever times when you're like, like stuck? You can't think. You've got like effectively creators block or whatever you might call it. You know. Um, well, I mean, honestly, man, I, I mean, I've been on the road now for two and a half months, been feeling stuck quite a lot, generally speaking. Um, that's a whole nother story in itself. Um, I wasn't expecting a parade when getting back from New Zealand, but I was definitely not expecting what I got. Um, and I don't really know how much I can talk about that, but Fair it enough. wasn't, yeah, it wasn't what I expected. And soon parties really owe me one hell of a fucking apology. Um, for wasting my time. 10,000 miles is a long way to fly, man. Especially when it's your first flight out, you know? Yeah. Um, so, you know, to come here and, and, and basically, you know, I don't care if the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing, but when the left hand does a one hour podcast with me two weeks earlier saying, come to LA, we love your tech and we'll make you useful. And it's on the fucking record. And then I get here and nothing happens. And I get absolutely ghosted because the right hand sees me as a conflict of interest just don't waste my fucking time, man. My daughter drove her car for the first time a few days ago. I should have been there. Yeah. Yeah. Do so, you, do you, do you find that to be, that, that, that caused writer's block? I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like yeah. this being on the road is, is stopping me and my, my dev back in New Zealand getting really serious work done due to basic things like lack of internet, 
moving from hotel to hotel, uh, you know, getting accosted in Mexico, which is another story in itself. Um, <laughs> <Yes>. you, know, <laughs> um, you know, I'm trying to say, man, it's, 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 you know, um, I, I came here with very limited funds. I've had to blow a whole bunch of my Tesla stock just to be here. Um, you know, about 20 K over the last two and a half months. And that 20 K would be 40 K now, just to be clear, because I had to dip into it when it was only 660. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, writer's block is just having to do this hustle bullshit. Gotcha. Yeah. Put me back in my fucking bedroom and feed me and pat my head and let me roam around the, the block for a while, you know, just, I, I love being an outside cat, but you know, I don't mind being an inside cat either, you know? Right. Like, yeah. I can do both. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think it's like, it's interesting, especially like the reason why I asked, like in your, in what you do, it seems like there's more like pro, like we're saying, like problem solving, like, if you know if someone's like right, we want you to capture this space or whatever yeah. um or create this application of something that's been captured like the there isn't so much of a whole lot of ideation on your end am i incorrect on this it's it's sort of more like you have processes of things you do and then mm -hmm. when presented with the job or the project like you're like well i have done this a million times it's just this is a new iteration of that yeah 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 absolutely so we joke about every time we got a project we treat it like an r&d job we just didn't tell the client <laughs> <That's good. laughs> no literally like literally uh when i when i okay i'll give you an example of this so uh nefertari when i did nefertari in 2018 yeah uh you know they they, they fly me all the way from new zealand to um Luxor. it was a 36 hours in the air in total Right. Uh, the first flight was 19 hours, the longest flight that exists uh, from New Zealand to Dubai. Um, so I get there, I, I'm jet lagged as hell. There's so many funny stories about Nefertari, but this is probably one of the funny ones. So we get to the tomb, everyone's running around just bringing coffee and all that kind of stuff. It's just me and my Pelican case, dude. And I run downstairs with my, my, my modified equipment and blah, blah, blah. And I just, you know, I go to this corner where I quickly take some photos. I run back upstairs and they're like, what are you doing? Get back down there. I'm like, no, no, I just need to find something out. I just need to test something. You know, throw the data center reality capture, quickly press a line and process. And I'm like, oh, thank fucking God. And they're like, what did you just do? I, just, I was just like, oh, I'd never tested de lighting before. And like, they're like, so you, you flew all the way here to test out a technique to see if you could de light and PBI extract the tomb, but you hadn't tested it before flying here? I was like, yeah, but my hypothesis was correct. <laughs> 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 I also find it interesting that like they were all that concerned with your exact movements of what you're doing. Like, it, well, they, no, they, they could see us trying to just they could see us literally testing something on the spot. And they're like, what? Are you? Just trust me, God. I just, and I, 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 I mean, I, I knew it was going to work, but you know, I refer to it as future truths. Um, mm. it's it's this thing where you know you have like ninety nine point nine two percent certainty of something, and it just makes absolute sense to you and. The future troops have yeah. always been like, I, I, I can't, and I don't want to sound like a dick saying this, I can't think of a future truth that I've had that hasn't actually panned out to be what one was to expect. And so it's, um, I've, I've learned to have a certain level of confidence in it. Um, but it does, it does, it does angst the fucking clients like something crazy. Um, but it's also, I mean, look, it came out as, you know, it's still standing there as probably one of the best VR experiences out there. And that's that's a build that I've been sitting on for years. You should see the internal one. The internal one, Nvidia and Epic and all that have been running around with for years. It's, it's a ten times better. Yeah, um, I find that to but, be the case yeah. with what you were saying with photogrammetry. Like when I first got into it, it was like I think the very first thing I ever tried was the stupidest thing ever. It was like this: we have these weird bike racks in the Brooklyn Navy Yard that some yeah. guy found. They, Sorry, the bike racks are, are co they're cool. Uh, yeah. uh, no slight on the guy that fabricated them. But I guess the Navy Yard had hired a guy who works in the Navy Yard, like a fabricator. Yeah. They kind of look like sh uh, ships uh, before they're like, I don't know what you call it. The facade is put on them, like old wooden ships. You just have the skeleton. Right, right. That's what the bike racks kind of resemble, but they're made out of metal. 
anyways, we shot this and it was yeah. like, but with bikes on it. It's my first ever trial. Oh, it difficult. was just the most, but, but, but I remember it was the coolest thing just to see the sort of like the point cloud. And it was like, not mm. very dense. It was like the initial test run. I was just like, Oh, like it's we're starting to connect the dots, you know what I mean? And so, yeah. the, but you learn over time that there is, you know, but you sound a bit more confident than I ever was at doing it. But like, uh, there's always a bit of like, I want to just like throw something in and just do like a quick rough mesh, like a mild point cloud, just to see if it's working. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, 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 I'm not sure if that's part of your process, but it's just definitely like this idea of like creating photogrammetry for VR experiences or however they're showcasing what you do afterwards is somewhat of a science, but it's also not because like everything is different. You don't really know where the occlusions are going to be. Every single, you can see it like, yeah. oh, I think that's going to be an occlusion problem, but you don't yeah. effectively know till you get there. So you guys are using LIDAR as well in the process? Uh, not anymore? Only, only when applicable, only when really strictly needed. Okay. Um, I've, I've got nothing against that. I mean, we, we can even use Nerf data. Um, right. So we, did, we, we can just, um, with Big Pipe, the new tool, we, we can pretty much throw it all in mm. and um, decide and post what takes precedence, I guess you could say. Right. So the way we're treating the data is just massive. I mean, um, I don't know how technical you want me to get on Big Pipe, but it's, it's pretty friggin' cool, dude. Uh, yeah, I mean, you uh, feel free to dive into it a bit because my experience, uh, LIDAR is always needed for anything. It's like reflective and like things like that. Yeah, you know? and, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, there's still applications like that, but we've been using techniques over the years, like um, using even Lyco projectors just to project a bit of faint noise into a scene that was only visible by the camera sensor, but not necessarily by the human eye. And so that was one of the techniques we've used for years. So it is, it's, I, I refer to it as a cheap man's LIDAR. Just get a few Lyco, like shitty little Lyco projectors, that, or just to project noise, and dial right. it down so much that it's barely perceivable. And then you can use a noise profile to then remove that noise later out of the texture. That's yeah. so genius. Yeah, I know. I know. I just, I, I just came up with it one day. <laughs> That's I had, I, so I couldn't afford, genius. I couldn't, afford, I couldn't afford lighter, so I just, I just, I just got a laser and a fucking prism, dude. Basically. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Man, and I wish I had ha known that hack years ago. Yeah, no, that was 2016. Yeah. You, you, that's the first time I've ever mentioned it on a podcast, by the way. But, you know, this 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 me is old shit, so I'm just like, eh, whatever. You know, but... <laughs> so but that's the stuff that you're. I find intriguing about what you're doing, you know, is like mm -hmm. your brain is going there. Like, I ha here's a problem I have. I can't afford mm -hmm. LiDAR, but I Dude, need I, a I way for the camera to not... I literally just churn this shit overnight it literally wow. invades my dreams man i'm not kidding it's it it becomes a like you know how they'll say just sleep on it kind of process i mean that yeah. is a literal thing yeah interesting it's, it's always been like that um so give me a flyover of the big pipe okay yeah so big pipe is pretty much everything from well it's not the point cloud acquisition it's not the point cloud creation but from that point cloud dense mesh that you get from reality capture, it's mm -hmm. everything until that to dropping the whole entire thing into Unreal Engine and adding some lighting. Okay. So LODs, uh, efficient, effective uh, unwrapping of light maps and texture maps and UDIMs, mm -hmm. um, PB, PBR extrapolation, super sampling, in painting of missing detail. Um, uh, um, retopology essentially. Yep. Um, massive amounts of cleanup. So, uh, d d you know, even if your point cloud is extremely varied in its density because of how you've taken the photos, right. it deals with all of that. It, but it also deals with the texture side of that. So, if your textures are extremely varied as a result of that, it will super sample for textures that have less detail. Um, it will fill in missing information. And it will simplify you know. the mesh too. Yep, yep, yep. Because you're going to have to break it down, right? Yep, it, it does segmentation and, and LOD separation. Uh, so LOD separation and segmentation. So we can throw in a 40 million mesh, but you can have only like 400,000 shown on screen at any given time. Um, you know, uh, does it all, uh, and it does it all in hours. Wow. So what would take my team Nefertari 
or the Homestead, you know, the Art Gallery one, that Mark mm-hmm. Petit, my mentioned, said is the best thing he's ever seen in VR um, a few months ago. So that's a bit of a jab at earlier. If you have an alco- uh, if you have sorry, if you have a website, those accolades should be written out on your website. Yeah, I know. I, I, I did. I did a 2017 promotion where I, I had you know all the all the industry leaders you know saying such things. I just haven't. I mean, I can't do everything, dude. I mean, I, I'm a team of two, literally. Like, right. I'm not, I'm, yeah. I mean, we 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 we've, we've been lean hacker housing this for years. Occasionally get a little bit of money, but um, the worst thing that happened to us was the pandemic hitting us exactly at the same time we got a mega grant. Right. And so we, we couldn't hire our way out of a problem, dude. Like I, I went from like a team of two to a team of 11 with major contracts with Facebook research and everyone else. But we got stuck in New Zealand and we and because of the pandemic, we were building big pipe and DPPR into a cloud based solution. But because we didn't we, you know, every AWS developer got hired out of fruition, essentially. So, you know, um, but yeah, uh, so I got a bit off subject there. Um, uh, yeah, it tackles pretty much everything. And, and, and the funny thing is, it's mostly expert systems. There's very little AI involved. It's basically, I got so sick of where to stealing all my staff. You know, I'd spend three to six months training someone up and then right. they'll just get poked because where or someone else could pay them better. I was like, fuck it, I got to put myself into a bottle. And so uh, October, November last year, uh, I, you know, once again, I don't know how much I can say about this. I might have got a second mega grant, if you want to call it that, mm. um, where it allowed me not to go homeless or bankrupt. And me and my guy, Mark, over the summer just ha- and he wasn't even, a, you know, he, he was like an intermediate Python guy, but he knew a bit about Blender and he knew how to design stuff in Unity. And so we just spent the summer hacking away at it over dance parties and in a beautiful New Zealand summer and just built the damn thing. Um, and so we basically put all the techniques I'd known from anything post or anything pre late 2019, right. just put the scripts and processes. But the beautiful thing that Big Pipe does that, for the best of my knowledge, nothing else does is that when you have photogrammetry data, let's say in reality capture, you know, you get 4 billion points, right? Right. Now, the way people do it now is they decimate that down to 60 million or 40 million so they can run in ZBrush and do, you know, start actually working on it, right? It's madness. Why would you build 4 billion points just to decimate it from, you know, delete every nth point? <laughs> yeah. And then start cleaning it up. So what our system does is it, it hierarchically breaks it all up into chunks, essentially, and just does the whole process from the raw point cloud. But it does a whole bunch of analytics in advance so it knows the bigger picture without having to see the bigger picture. And so the decimation you get is actually so much closer to the original. And so the 60 million that you get is so much cleaner, so much evenly distributed, but protecting detail where detail matters, you know, big polygons where it's just flats. And yeah. so you get your starting point is your starting point for, if you want to say cleanup, is just so much better that you probably have about 5% of the work that you would have to do otherwise. But more importantly, um, it it's so much closer to the original that when you reproject all the right. textures and everything else, it's just that much sharper. So yeah. like on a wall, is it simplifying it to like four points? points? Yeah. yeah, yeah like- a few points. But, if, but if there's a flower or a leaf or like, like you could have the, the, the Think of a think of a rose in the middle of a football field. Okay. And imagine how dense the whole thing would be and ra di ra di ra. The rose will have like 20, 40, 60,000 polygons. The football field will have like 100. And so it, it's, it, it does adaptive decimation and retopology and subdiv and fill in of subdiv of missing detail all at the same time. So you're left with something that is just, so, you know, you can basically drag and drop from that point, but we've designed it so you can have human intervention to jump in to, you know, maybe less around something you don't want, or maybe there's a big floater that just doesn't make any sense, like a big piece of artwork that's hanging, but you know, the strings and attached quite right because the data wasn't good enough. You know, you can go and less around that and delete it, you know, just bring in the mesh mixer and just quickly yeah. circle and then continue on its process. So we have designed it so you can have moments of human interaction if human interaction is needed. But that's it. Everything wow. else is pretty much done. Yeah, I used to um, 
only because I saw someone else do it first. Uh, mm. And I didn't know, like, Mesh Mixer when I first started out, things like that. So, But I used yeah. to take stuff. There's that guy. You've probably, I'm sure you've met him. Um, his name, is it Oz is his name? Um, he worked, he ended up working for Reality Capture in the, uh, somewhere in the middle of, like, 2018 or something like that. But he would yeah. take... A, f a scan from reality capture export out the obx or sorry the fbx or whatever to or the obj to medium oculus medium yeah yeah and then inside medium i would do the retopology just fixing all the holes and just all that kind of stuff and then bring it back into reality capture and just reproject the textures back onto it and it was like such a fun process but dude yeah. i was spending 18 hours like a day in a VR headset trying to wow, <laughs> because wow. I was doing retopology wow. in VR of yeah. uh, of a space that I captured you know yeah. it's yeah. it's ridiculous that somebody would do that now but back then it, it felt like this is the way because I'm in VR yeah, yeah. still you know no medium I mean I really wanted to go down that path too man like um reason I didn't was I couldn't handle the poly count of course you always had to decimate yeah. the crap out of it before you put it in there yeah yeah and so that was the frustrating thing and so we thought about like maybe treating it like how you deal with prores video and you have like in premiere you have like you know the downscale version of a prores thing that you can edit we tried yeah. to think about there ways that we could do it like that but uh we, we we as much as i would love to do you know clean up in 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 vr uh it just wasn't feasible at the time and it's it's so too, now, it's too you, manual anyways. Now it's yeah. you, you don't need to, now you see you don't need to. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, when I say retopology, it's not quantification. It's still triangles. It's just very very tidy triangles. Yeah. Well, mine's yeah. visual though. In that respect. like in yeah. medium, you're painting with a three D brush. Yeah. So, yeah. so if there's a wall that had a hole in it, I would go through yeah. with just with the like cube brush and just. Oh, I know. It was so like good. I was a mason. It was kind of yeah. like it's, it's yeah. satisfying, but you're like, you look back, you're like, that's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, I, I, think, I, I mean, medium or mesh mixer, I think like if, if medium, I don't know where it is now, but if it can handle 60 million points, that would be fucking amazing. No, uh, it was last time I messed with it, it was like 15,000. It was, it was, oh, for fuck's sake. It was yeah. I was, I was literally crashing that program to figure out where the line was. Like I would try to bring it in, it would crash <laughs> the headset. It's like, yeah. what is the line? I, yeah. I feel like it was like 15,000 or something. It was something yeah. ridiculously low. But it would be like a 40 million um, scan, you know? And you're like, yeah. dude, this yeah. is crazy. <laughs> that is cool. That is cool. Yeah. But that's awesome. Yeah. So you guys developed Big Pipe. That's your yeah, thing. Yeah, me, 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 and, me and my intermediate guy, like, just had to give over summer. Um, and you know, I mean, like once again, it's a bit like the home theater PC system. It is a lot of components that have been scripted together. So, you know, we didn't write certain components of big pipe that big pipe utilizes, but we found ways to make those components work for what we needed. Right. So, uh, one, one of the cool things we've done is, you know, we've used essentially a third party unwrapper, but we found a, we found a way to make that third party unwrapper use world space. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, and so what I mean by world space is that. The way capturing reality unwraps right now, you ask it to unwrap is really fast, but it, it drops triangles all over that big UDM space. Let's say you have 80 UDMs, right? Right. It will drop, you know, one part of the leaf will be over there, one part of the leaf will be over there. So when you then throw into texture streaming in, in Unreal Engine or Unity or whatever or online, you know, the, the, the texture stream is having to like find the islands that are very dispersed and apart. Um, we, 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 we rebuilt the thing so it literally does the unwrapping but it does the unwrapping localized based on you know the chunks you have so it's basically keeping everything together in one space and where that benefits is that when we do our in painting our in painting looks at density and all this other kind of stuff and goes well there's nothing there and because it's been packed in world space the surrounding information that is good is going to be relatively what it needs to know so the, 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 the yeah the in painting works much better when things are kept together and the streaming works considerably better. That's great. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's just things like that. So, you know, I mean, we, we, we basically built it around blender, um, with a yep. little bit of C plus plus code that we custom built that blender reaches out to and a little bit of ML code. That's just throwing in a few, you know, throwing a few texts through a few GANs essentially. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if somebody is like 
listening to this and they're mm. maybe younger and they're like, man, I kind of, I kind of feel like I'm like that guy. I kind of feel like, what would you, what would you, what advice would you give to somebody who is maybe wanting to get into the VR space or anything that you're dabbling in right now? Yeah. The world is really scary right now, man. I'll just be honest. Um, and you know, I do feel like we're kind of part of it. Um, and so, uh, you know, the prep talk would be nice and all. Uh, what I would say is the automation components of things are relatively going to be completely solved in the next year or two mm. um, on a lot of fronts. And so the only thing I can say, and I say this to my daughters, get into arts and crafts. <laughs> you know, be the person who's actually running around with the camera, um, taking the stuff, you know, right. doing, you know, uh, because the actual, the, the grunt work, you know, the, as, as Weta would say, the hun the hundred monkeys, uh, it's not a hundred monkeys very soon. And so the actual, you know, the pushing pixels component is, 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 is solved essentially what isn't solved and what won't be solved is the creative side of things. Like, you know, that's the level design, you right. know, those kind of things like, um, gamification components to some degree will be quite some time you know it's, it's it's and i think that's not a bad thing i think it's just i think people are going to, um you know i mean i think everyone's going to be and, and this is once again why i'm getting a lot of pushback um from certain entities i think everyone's going to be their own mega scans very soon if you know what i'm trying to say yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so you know, where you have a mega scans library where, you know, Quixel's running around, got 20, 30 guys taking photos of objects and things. Uh, what DPBR and Big Pipe offers is the ability for everyone to build their own mega scans library, uh, you know, within days versus whatever. And right. so, um, but that's a good thing because, you know, uh, with virtual production and, get uh, these level design. I mean, at the moment, if you go into mega scans and you want some bricks from London, it's like maybe two or three different textures of right. bricks from London. Uh, at some point, people are going to start noticing that all the same bricks are in the background of that fucking London scene. You know? <laughs> so so I, I don't think it's a bad thing. I, I, I think it's, I think it's a world of abundance. I think it's great, hmm. but you still got to have people actually building the environments from those assets and from those things. Yeah. And, the argument I make about what we're doing is, you know, it's great that AI is going to be able to synthesize, you know, a thousand different interpretations of London, but nothing beats the real thing. And so if you have people running around actually taking photos of the real thing and having that as a digital ledger, a, you know, essentially a ledger of, of time and past, um, I think that's the coolest thing to do. And so, you know, everyone's coming up to me going, oh, AI is going to take over your job, blah, 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 blah. You know, it's, it's going to be able to synthesize all the stuff. Yeah, but how, does, how the fuck does it synthesize it? It works on training data. So it's our job as humans, basically, to acquisition the training data. Yeah. But also, also keep a, a digital, what we call, um, oh, sorry, I've forgotten the word, um, you know, ground truth. You know, so in deep learning terms, ground truth means just original data. Yeah. That's extremely important to have do you do you think that <clears throat> sort of these creative industries are going to go through a period of as you were sort of suggesting complete automation where everything is starting to look the same and then they're mm -hmm. going to have this like i think realization of like uh uh we kind of want something a little more real yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. Then, and then they're oh, going to be like wait oh, who's oh, that oh, guy oh. who does the stuff that's real actually real but the thing is what i'm saying is i think everyone should be the guy that does everything real Sure. Like we don't want this, we we want we what we're doing with deep PBR was essentially we were starting with textures, moving from textures to assets and then assets to environments. But all the data to build that was going to come from a million people on their and their smartphones. You know, so that's the whole yeah. idea behind deep PBR was it was actually a community marketplace. It was a turbo squid essentially. Yes. Um and we you know, we were we were having serious conversations about embedding this directly into certain game engines uh, and all the rest of it. Um, and as I just said, I think that I think um, community driven content creation isn't in the interest of some of the bigger companies. And it really pains me saying that. 
when it comes to assets, when it comes to these initial asset assets. No, yeah. they have yeah. no they still have no trouble with you using them as assets and doing level design with them, but the actual assets themselves, uh, you know, and I've seen this with every major company, and I, you know, obviously I don't need to name names because we all know who they are. They all want they all want to have their version of the metaverse, and they have no interest in having a, a, a you know, an eclectic, community driven, open metaverse. That was yeah. something I said to a lot of the people I think at my company where I work now. Uh, are just sort of opening their eyes to metaverse kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and I uh, use the term very loosely. I don't like using that term, but you yeah. know, I'm well, no, yeah. I'm with you in the sense of like, uh, when, when Zuckerberg made his big announcement, you know, about like his metaverse or whatever, uh, yeah. some people at my company were like, Oh, isn't that cool? Don't you kind of do stuff in that in your past life, Mickey? And I was just like, mm. yeah, but the joke is, uh, Mark thinks it's going to be his metaverse, but, <laughs> I've already helped build the regular, like the yeah, metaverse yeah, on, yeah, a, a, on yeah. the whole before this dope showed up, you know? It's yeah, like, yeah. It like, it already what exists. What's he talking about? It's just not fully fleshed out yet because it just takes time. But yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, it's it's such a funny, that term is going to be a very, uh, I don't know, strange term in the coming decade. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we're into real world encapsulation. You know, if you want to throw real world encapsulation into a metaverse, we're fine with that. But, you know, we're yeah. in the business of actually backing up the real world for, you know, virtual experience. Um, one great. of the things we really loved about what we're planning, to, and, you know, I talk about this in my TEDx way back in late 2019. I was using the term distributed ledger via NAS rights management. I think they call it NFTs now. Um, and multiple, because I, I, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I don't use cliche terms. We, we were inventing these terms before they were terms. Right. You know, um, but I really do feel if you give the artist, in this case the photographer, the ability to go out and actually encapsulate these spaces and get it on there, the artist also decides what those spaces and places and faces can be used for. Essentially, that's the artist rights management component. And through distributed ledger is the way that we protect it through a distributed ledger. So blockchain, whatever the fuck you want to call it, but, you know, a database, essentially a backed up database so no one can, you know, dick anyone around. And so then when a museology environment, like a museum or a virtual production studio or whatever wants to use that asset for whatever purpose, they know what they can and cannot use it for. As I say, you don't want uh, you don't want stripper poles and mud eyes, mud eyes being Murray House of Worship, right? Yeah. Um, but the most important thing is the artist who took those initial photographs – Gets a gets a paycheck as a musician, right. man. Like, I had multiple pa uh, play on radio, right? I never got my APRA paycheck. That really pissed me off because mm. the only thing I wanted was show my mum that I had a check for a hundred bucks for my radio play. You know, right. never got it. Yeah, so I'm really in the trenches on this one. Like for me, it's personal. I just want to see the people who are actually on the ground acquisitioning the data you know, getting a fair shake. Uh, the studios sure. get environments for amazing use cases and at, at, at fractions to the dollar, everyone benefits. Um, but you just got to make sure that the person who actually took the damn photograph in the first place at least, you know, gets to retain some level of rights to that data in its original raw format. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I like that, man. I, I wholeheartedly agree. Hmm. I think that's <clears throat> that's the potential that we all saw, you know, from the dawn of the internet till now, in that yeah. situation. Yeah. yeah. Um, where can people see uh, some of your work? Is if there, if there's any, you know, VR experiences or? or... Well, I mean, I, I, can, I can tell you the work that we can publicly talk about. So I am under. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I can't even state that it's our own work. You know, it kind of sucks, but hey, that was cool. You know, having to pay rent. And I understand. Um, the homestead is free. That's from 2018. We started doing that in 2016. So the homestead uh, on Steam, uh, Nefertari. You can obviously go and check out on Steam. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I have New Zealand Parliament on Steam as well, but that's not our finest work. I think I think the thing that would really get people's attention, uh, my two works from 2018, uh, which is Nefertari and the homestead. And obviously, you can just watch a whole bunch of random YouTube videos where I talk about deep PPR and big pipe. It's on my channel, Simon Shadabor, YouTube. Um, awesome. The name's hard to spell, but it'll be on the thing here. So people got to look it <laughs> Yeah. <up. laughs> they'll, they'll have the spelling. They'll have uh, 
the 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 YouTube, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. I'm not really good at self promotion. I know it sounds crazy. I'm. It's a fucking hot mess. The website hasn't been updated for two years. <laughs> I understand. Don't, we, don't a, we don't have a marketing and sales guy, man. <laughs> I totally get it. That's something yeah, as yeah. an artist I've had to learn to get to do. Like I, yeah. My website, my personal website, has been in disarray for. A, quite a while till recently ironically enough really quickly we had some mm-hmm. new like y- younger hires at our company cool. and we got to meet them virtually through teams to microsoft teams whatever and then because they're in california and then they were like yeah well i think our head was like just you know put your websites down below mm-hmm. or something we can just get a better idea of who you are even though we can't really meet you just it'd be really cool whatever find comment to say and i was like He's like, no, we, you guys should do it too. Like everybody in this chat. And I was like, uh, okay. No, <laughs> but it, friendly, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it lit a fire though because I, I was like, all right, I put, I put like a hard four days into just whipping my site into shape, and now it's legit. But cool. uh, so, I, cool. so I totally get like, you're just out there doing the work, and you're like, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I, I had to switch to doing a pitch deck. I'd never used PowerPoint in my life. I did a massive twenty-eight pager. Pitch deck about DPPR a year ago. It looks fucking amazing. So you know, if I if I actually I can do website design really well. I mean, I've got a background in design, obviously. Yeah. Um, but it's just it's just that compartmentalization thing again. Like I, I whipped the website into shape two years ago, but that was two years ago. Uh, right. The best thing would actually be these long form podcasts I've done over the years, just so people can actually validate that the same message has been said from day one. You know, very Bernie Sanders. You know, <laughs> the message has not changed at all, man. Right, um, right. And it's funny, the future truths that I talk about, you know, in these long form podcasts in 27, 2018, they, you know, they all came fully into fruition. Um, you know, we, we, we did nail it when we said what was going to take place. So um, there's a little bit of validity in that. Um, but also, look, I'm available for t- children's birthday parties, man. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I am actually looking for work. I mean, that's the crazy thing. I, I've been, I've had my camera here in the United States for two and a half months. Right. Um, haven't used it it's just nuts uh well, we, we we were expecting to be tested when i landed here but certain parties didn't even want to test us so right um yeah so it's been yeah i'm 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 i'm, I'm available to you know short-term work whatsoever and um if there's anything i've learned i can keep my mouth shut um if it's a big company small company uh you know what i mean if it's, you know what i mean i'm I, I would prefer just to work with people on the ground, small little indie studios and whatnot. I, I'm really over the big players just treating me like some kid in the custody battle, man. So, you know, rather fucking be in the trenches again. For sure. Yeah. Well, thank you for hanging out and telling me and, and the people who listen uh, a little bit about your job and what you do. It's perfect for what I'm doing here on this podcast, which is like <laughs> it, show people what yeah. kind of creative jobs are out there and, and just how yeah. wide of a variety there is. What's and all, man. What's and all. And I, I think that people need to know the absolute, the good and the bad. Like people just need to know that, the, you know, no one needs the polished version of this. So I really appreciate being able to talk openly and freely about that kind of jazz. So really appreciate it, bud. Awesome. Well, thank you. So I'll, I'll, I'll give all the info down below so people can see it wherever they're consuming the podcast. Awesome. Thanks, man. Cool. Thank you. It was an honor.